um, thank you for coming out and joining us, <clears throat> excuse me, and supporting the um, college's democracy commitment. Um, I'm Tamara Coleman-Hill, the faculty coordinator here for the democracy commitment. And um, uh, Ann Henson will be speaking as a part of our faculty lecture series, um, following the theme, What is the Promise of Democracy? And she's going to be talking with us about education and democracy and the importance of really um, uh, providing that kind of uh, democratic uh, education and learning in our schools. Um, so thank you all for joining us. And I hope you will um, come out for uh, the next in our series, which is um, March uh, I'm sorry, March 18th, Tuesday when we come back from spring break, and then we have another lecture uh, in April, and so look out for those. All right, thank you. Anne. Okay. Thank you for attending. Uh, today I'm going to talk about democracy and education and how we go about democratizing our classrooms and making democratic citizens of our students. So what I'm going to start with is actually asking you to take a moment and really consider what you believe democracy to be. What is your personal definition of democracy? Um, I start there because I think that most of us get lost in really the procedural aspects of democracy, such as voting. And we don't think about ourselves as democratic citizens. Um, some common definitions of democracy, <clears throat> excuse me, just to start us out, um, it's a political system, right, for choosing and replacing the government through voting. Um, and hopefully free and fair elections, although this is Chicago. So then we have the active participation of the people as citizens in politics and civic life. This I'm going to elaborate on further in thinking about how we create these people who, again, are, are civic-minded and politically-minded starting in our classroom. There's also the third common definition of democracy, which is protection of the rights of all citizens. Lastly, we have as a rule of law, um, which the laws and procedures apply equally to all citizens. So those are, again, just some common definitions. But where I'm going to elaborate today is really on that second one, um, the active participation of people as citizens in a civic um, society. Okay. So then I'm going to move here. Uh, I'm just going to jump ahead for a second. Oops. And get you to think about this. So before I move actually into the slide, I want to just get you to rate the, what you believe is the overall quality of democracy in our country. So how fairly do you think all people are treated? Um, do you think all people have equal rights? Do you think all people are valued equally? And if not, where, where are we um, falling with that? Where, you know, where, where can we do better? The second question I would like you to think about is rating the quality of democracy in our institution. So how equally are you treated in a class or as, a, as an institution as a whole? Um, how fairly do you think that students are treated in general? Do you feel like your voice is heard? Do you feel like you're an active participant of your educational community? Um, getting you to think about that really gets, gets started the conversation about democracy and again about democratizing our classrooms. So as I said here, I'm going to actually talk about John Dewey for a moment. And John Dewey may not be a name that's familiar to everybody that's here today, but John Dewey was, um, first and foremost, an educational reformer. He spent his entire life writing about educational reform with democracy at the heart of all of those writings. Dewey lived from about 1859 to 1952. He was a prolific writer. He churned out um, pretty much 80 years' worth of material, again, related to this issue of democracy. Um, as I say here, John Dewey spent his, his career trying to wean Americans away from what he considered our overly state-centric understanding of democracy. Again, really looking at ourselves as just voters, that that's the only way we exercise our democratic values. Um, he wanted to get us away from that and into truly a mode of being democratic, a mode of life that's democratic, a mode of being involved in civic practices and civic, um, civic behaviors. Okay, And so while I don't want to get too nostalgic or sentimental in talking about Dewey, because Dewey really felt that we should also try to change people spiritually, I don't want to talk too much about that aspect because that's not something that I do in my classroom. But I, I do think that um, it's important for us to realize what an impact that John Dewey has on 21st century problems, right? And the way that we, again, conduct our classrooms and conduct ourselves as democratic beings. If we look at it again as democracy is this mode of being, right? <clears throat> So Dewey was really convinced that um, by continuing to heed this popular notion of emphasizing democracy as nothing more than a set of external institutions tied to the state, 
that we were Americans in name only and we were Democrats in name only because we really hadn't developed the um, moral and spiritual dimensions that were necessary for us to truly be democratic. Okay? So again, he argues that what we need to do is take democracy a step further and internalize it and make it this mode of being, this way that we, um, that we think about things, we process things, we question things, we review, we revise. He wanted us to internalize it so that we were conscious of our democratic decisions and our everyday dealings. And he wanted us to uh, really take this idea of democracy uh, to task in the way that we treat others and the way that we really stand up for others. That was a big issue with John Dewey as well. He didn't want us to just be empty shelled democratic citizens without any concern about the well being of others and the common good. Okay. So, like I said, John Dewey really felt that his role um, as an educator and then the role of education in general was to identify and then develop the spiritual and moral dimensions of democracy, okay, rather than those conventional methods or conceptions of democracy. Um, so how do we do this? <clears throat> In our classrooms today, the way that we can um, apply Dewey's concepts of democracy are by teaching our students that democracy is vital and it's biophilic, it's alive, and that's a term from Frary. Frary says that we need to make education something that's a living organism, that when we're engaging in dialogue, again, it's biophilic. It's not cut off. It's, it's moving. It's changing. It's constantly transforming. And that's where it leads me, is this idea of education as transformation, that, that biophilic um, democratic dialogues in the classroom, and I know that's a lot to take in, but these very living dialogues right, that we're engaged in, that we are a part of, that we believe in, um, that that's what transforms us, whether it's at a personal level, a civic level, um, a political level, right? That's what transforms our, our thinking. So again, the ways that I do this, I try to get my, my students to, first of all, respect one another. And I think that that's fairly easily done. Um, I don't think that I, I really have to, you know, have too many words with students about how to treat one another. But I do think that we have to have conversations about um, individualism versus individual individuality, which is something that Dewey talks about and I'll talk about in a minute, in terms of the ways that we respect one another. I try to get my students to engage in discussion, um, to get them to engage in debate, um, to get them to engage in deliberate thought. And what that means, deliberate thought, means that um, I try to get my students to be able to back up their positions. Well, first of all, to identify their positions, because let's face it, we all walk in with positions in place, with values in place. And so by getting my students to really question where that position came from, or question why they have the value that they do, it then leads them into deliberate thought. They are deliberately thinking about how those positions or values um, really create and shape identity for them. And then the big task at hand here, when I talk about transforming, how education can transform, uh, the big task is to get students to the point where they're willing to change those positions or change those values. So then we move into some critical thinking. After deliberate thought, some critical thinking, again, about the positions we hold, the values that we have. And then we move into synthesis, so bringing it all together, bringing all these positions together and understanding other people's positions, which obviously ties back into respect for one another. And then lastly, persuasion. I want my students, um, I want the actual practices that we undertake in class to move on with them. I want my students to become not only um, lifelong learners who are willing to question, but I want my students to be, um, to, or to lead healthy civic lives to again question the common good, to um, define the common good, to look at the bigger issues and see how they are a part of the student, right? To look at social issues, civic issues, and see that they have a voice in changing these and again transforming their lives. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so when dealing with Dewey, and I don't bring Dewey into my classes just because he's a little bit too uh, maybe religious, again, those spiritual practices. But what, what I do take from Dewey is Dewey's um, study of, 
of some earlier material, particularly those platonic dialogues. And in class, I've talked about the allegory of the cave. And from the allegory of the cave, we have the term educare. Okay? Educare. And what educare means it is that instead of functioning as a teacher in a classroom, what you are working toward is becoming a facilitator. And as a facilitator, what you do there is then try to draw out the um, capacities, potentials, and values of your students. Okay? In doing that, you are, you are allowing students to again go back and review and revise the positions that they have, the values that they hold, and consider why they have them, why they hold them, um, and then how they can be changed, and how the student's potential or capacity can be changed as a result. This practice really does bring, in, bring students into higher levels of cognition. It uses those higher level thinking skills. Um, and this is, I, I feel fortunately, um, at odds with a traditional mode of education, which is that banking system. And we've talked a lot about that in class, as Freire talks about, you know, that banking system of just depositing information. Educare doesn't allow me, if I truly practice educare, it doesn't allow me to just dump information into my students and hope for the best. Instead, what it, what it requires me to do is ask open-ended questions that lead my students into deliberate and critical thought, again into then review and revision of the, of the ideas that they have or the, again, positions or values that they hold. I want my students to recognize that this old drill and grill, like the pump and dump system of education doesn't work. That doesn't work either when we think about um, our, our um, civic society. Okay. When we just listen to perhaps like a few speeches by a few politicians and we think that we know the whole story, we think we know their platform, we are really doing a disservice to ourselves as members of a civic society. It's our job to know more. It's our job to question. It's our job to think about the common good. It's our job to then think about how we need to take action so that the common good is put in place. Okay? That begins in the classroom by again getting students to recognize their own capacities, potentials, and values, and then question those if necessary to change those, we are leading them on the path to, to healthy civic lives. I don't want to, again, engage in the pump and dump with my students. I don't want to do the drill and grill. I don't want to deposit information. Because what that leads to is, a, a, I think, um, a scary word, actually, which is indoctr indoctrination. Okay? By filling my students with what I want them to know means they're only getting my perspective on, on information. I am by no means the authority on many issues. Ask anyone who knows me. Okay? I know a little bit about a couple of things. That's it. But when I go through and just lecture and again fill my students, if my students are vessels and I'm filling them with information that I believe to be true, information based on my position and my values, I'm indoctrinating them. And I'm not allowing them to think for themselves. This is what happens um, if we take it again, tying, tying politics and education together. If we take it a step further, when people are indoctrinated, we end up with Nazi Germany. Okay? That's what happens. So it has to really start with the classroom of getting students to um, you know, engage. Okay? I'm going to jump ahead here. And I have a list, a, a couple of lists actually of character traits or disposi dispositions that constitute democracy as a mode of being in, by my definition. Okay? The first character trait or disposition that constitutes democracy as a mode of being, right, a way of living, is questioning. <clears throat> if you are going to live in a democratic society and then internalize all of the qualities of democracy, you have to be willing to ask questions. As we talked about in class, when we read, when we read Freire, um, there's this real culture of silence among, among people. Okay? They're unwilling to ask questions. I think education's to blame for that. Education teaches you not to ask questions more often than it teaches you to ask questions. Um, but there's this culture of silence that exists and this unwillingness to do anything about a situation. Sometimes students don't ask questions because they're fearful um, of, of the response. They're fearful of maybe being looked down upon, maybe fearful of being treated poorly, um, maybe they're fearful of sounding stupid, um, maybe they're fearful of being picked on. Sometimes silence works in our favor in that way um, because it's like if I'm picking on, you know, if someone's picking on you, at least they're not picking on me. 
So you're silent. You don't ask any questions there. I also think that education has done a disservice to students when it comes to asking questions because there is this hierarchical system that exists within education and the teacher's at the top. And so um, it, it becomes almost a breach of authority or, um, you know, to even ask me a question. You shouldn't approach me with a question because I'm the teacher, right? We don't want that. We want to create students who ask questions. And again, not just questions in our classrooms, but questions about everyday life, particularly about their civic and political lives. Um, the threat of the question why to an oppressor, that's also taken from Freire. And in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, I think that it's one of the most important um, points that Freire makes. Because he says that if you have an oppressor, the most threatening thing you can do is ask them why. Why are they behaving in such a way? Why are they doing what they're doing? You know, why, uh, why are they treating you poorly? Why are they oppressing you? That question is dangerous to an oppressor because that question um, leads to um, rebellion, basically. Okay? The next point that I make here, a character trait that constitutes democracy as a mode of being is truly a passion for public affairs. The Greek term there is idios, and idios really means public life, a passion for public life. I think that this area, more than any other, is the one that we struggle with today, or at least I struggle with in my own classrooms. Students don't know a lot, and I'm sorry I'm, I'm making a very collective statement. Students don't always know a lot about the world that they live in. They don't know necessarily, you know, what's going on with Russia and the Ukraine right now. Why is that important to them other than maybe gas prices going up? Um, they don't necessarily know about social issues, conflicts within social issues, civic issues. We have to teach that. Again, if we look at Educari as this drawing out of capacities, potentials, and values, we have to get students talking about the world that they live in because it's ultimately going to be their world, right? They have to take responsibility for it, and they have to start asking questions about it. That leads to more knowledge. Um, I don't have a lot of students who are really um, civically or politically active. I have students who, who are you know, involved in what they're doing in their lives, and that's important, right? Your family, your friends, your job, your school, so on and so forth. But we have to take that a step further as educators and open their eyes up to what's going on around them, all right? It's not enough to say, I voted. It's not enough to wear the sticker and say, I voted. We have to teach students to ask questions about those people that they're voting for and to have the foresight to see how, how the person, that you know, potential, um, potentially elected individual, how that person can um, affect the common good. The next, the next character trait is dialogue. Dialogue is, in my opinion, um, or at least in my classrooms, I feel the easiest to accomplish. Um, Freire calls this problem-posing education. It's asking open-ended questions that, that get students to do some critical thinking, engage in deliberate thought. Um, again, synthesize, debate, persuade, review, revise. Dialogue is extremely important. Dialogue is really what leads us to knowledge more than anything else. Um, dialogue with, you know, amongst students is what leads them to collaborative learning opportunities. And then again, if we take that to a civic or political level, um, dialogue is what leads us to public forums and those town hall meetings. We need that. That's how we educate ourselves and each other, is by engaging in dialogue um, with others. We are not independent learners. It's not how humans are, are just made up. We are interdependent. We need one another in order to learn. Listening. Challenging and changing the role of the teacher. That's an important character trait. I heard somewhere at some point that good listeners uh, are really engaged in what the other person is saying rather than what we sometimes do. We are thinking while the other person is speaking. We're thinking about the answer that we're going to give rather than listening to what the person is saying. So we're formulating our response before they've even finished speaking. As a teacher, I try to take a step back and listen to what my students have to say rather than, again, formulating my response before they've even finished speaking. 
We need, as, as just society, to stop and listen to what other people say. Um, you know, again, if I'm, if I'm using you know, Nazi Germany as an example, maybe we should have listened then and not been caught up in propaganda. Maybe we should have listened to, you know, and torn apart the arguments and said, hey, does this really make sense? Should we be doing this? Is this in, in the best interest of the common good? But we didn't listen. Okay, we didn't listen, and look what happened. And my fear is that um, we're going to see the same sort of situations, not necessarily Nazi Germany, but we're going to see these situations continue to occur where we stop listening, we stop tearing apart what our political leaders are feeding to us, what, how they are indoctrinating us, and um, we're going to you know, act based on like popularity or, or um, you know, my civic duty to go vote, even though I don't really know what I'm doing because I haven't listened to any of it. Okay. Um, and as a teacher, I, I want to change and challenge myself to do more listening rather than more talking. Um, I think that it is a challenge for an instructor to step back and completely let go of any control of the classroom. If you instill these other um, values into your students, they'll be fine. There's no fear then attached to letting them guide their own conversations. But we have to work toward you know, getting them to respect one another, listen to one another, question um, in a healthy way one another. Okay, Then if we move on to our character traits of you know, adopting democracy as this mode of being, we have, a capacity, we have to have the capacity and the willingness to revise. That means changing things when they're not working anymore. That means listening to other people even when what they're saying is at odds with what you value. Even when what they're saying is at odds with the position that you're taking. We have to be willing to um, have the courage to do things differently. And in education, I think that this is um, maybe the most important point in education as a whole. As, you know, this is a systemic problem in American education is the unwillingness to revise or change. We've been doing things the same way since like the 19th century. You know, we, we might bring in some technology and say we're doing it differently, but ultimately we're not. We might flip our classrooms and say we're doing things differently, but we're not. As educators, we have to be willing to completely change the way that we're doing things because it isn't working anymore. Um, we have to be, take a look at the way that we're educating our students and again, preparing them for civic and political lives um, and, and be willing to say, you know, maybe the approach that I've taken for the last 10 years hasn't worked. What do I do differently? And then uh, again, on a political or civic level, we have to be willing to change society and society has to be willing to change. Um, a character trait here also is the ability to participate in imagining a common good. That's tough. That's tough. We have to imagine a common good on the local, state, and federal levels. What is in the best interest for the most people is the common good. That means you have to be willing to revise maybe what's good for you, what benefits you the most in favor of what's best for, our, for the majority of the people. right? One of the problems I think we could argue in, in politics today is that um, we've lost sight of the common good, and instead, what benefits the minority, right, that 1%, is what happens in this country. If we teach our students to ask questions about that, you know, or, or to question why it is the minority, that 1% that benefits, and really to revolt against it, um, we're going to start developing, you know, or upholding, I'm sorry, the common good. We have to have a sense of the moral equality of all human beings. This is a tough one for me. Um, we have to instill in our students that everybody is equal. Okay? We have to instill in our students that even if opinions are not equally valued, they are equally heard. Um, moral equality of all human beings means that you know, just, just this idea, I mean, as Dewey says, this very fundamental idea that everybody is born good, right? And so we have to understand that um, our students sometimes lose sight of that. Or what happens 
is that they get too um, lost within themselves, what Dewey would call individualism, and they stop thinking about the moral equality of others because it becomes what's good for me. We have to have faith and hope in the possibilities of, of the human, human nature, a belief in the common man, a celebration of the common man. Again, with individualism, I think we've lost, some, lost sight of some of that, where we aren't really concerned with how anybody else is doing. Instead, we're concerned about our own accomplishments. We're not keeping up even with the Joneses any longer. We're keeping up with ourselves and raising the bar ever higher. Um, we, you know, I, I hate it that in this country we come together as a nation in times of crisis. Right? Everybody remembers 9-11. And this country came together in a, in, never, in a way that it hadn't before in my lifetime at any rate. We, we were truly um, unified. And there was this real uh, patriotism that, that you know, was everywhere throughout this country. Dewey would say that that kind of unification, that kind of solidarity, makes us American in name only. Because after 9-11, you know, and, and a few months had gone by, we lost that fervor. We lost that, that um, great patriotism, right? That great spirit of patriotism. And we all went back to living our own lives. And the only real reminder of 9-11 at that point was like, you know, the codes, is it, is it code orange today? Can I fly? Is it code red? Is it green? And that was kind of it. Right? That, again, is what Dewey calls being an American in name only. Having this belief in the common man means that we, we don't wait for crisis to strike in order to uphold the common good. We don't have to, um, you know, wait for crisis to strike to believe that in some regard you are your brother's keeper. We don't have to wait for crisis to strike in order to take care of one another. All of that has to start in our classrooms. We have to teach our students to care about one another. Again, getting away from this individualism of my own success, my own accomplishments, and instead thinking about celebrating the accomplishments, the successes of others, and areas where other people might need your help. It is your duty to help. That's it. It is your duty to help. It is your duty to care for your, your um, classmate, you know, your, someone else who attends this school, someone who lives near you, someone who, who doesn't live near you. It is our duty to take care of other people. And then lastly is the desire and need to honor dissent. It's healthy. It keeps, as I say here, the body politic healthy to dissent. To dissent after asking those questions, right? Ask, after asking why, because like I said, that's the most threatening question someone can ask an oppressor. Why? Explain yourself. Um, by dissenting, we aren't causing revolt what we are, or a revolution. It's a re-evolution. We're causing things to change and to turn around. Then um, a few more of these, these character traits that we need to have if we are going to truly embody democracy. We have to have a capacity for a sense of justice and injustice. And what does Martin Luther King Jr. say? He says, you know, injustice anywhere is a, is a threat to justice everywhere. We have to be concerned with injustices. And again, we have, to, we have to speak out. We have to act out against them. That starts in our classroom. If you see somebody who's being bullied, if you see somebody who's treating unfairly, you have to act on their behalf. You have to take care of one another. Autonomous versus heteronomous um, personalities means this idea of individualism versus individuality, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, human beings as intrinsically social creatures, thus individualism destroys individuality. So if we take away um, you know, a person's social nature, if we don't have our students like work in groups and collaborate with one another and talk to one another and learn from one another, if we take those things away, we are instilling in them, um, or not instilling, but I guess um, strengthening their belief in individualism that it, this is about me and about me only, and I don't need anybody else to be a part of this. I don't need anybody else to succeed. I don't need anyone else to learn from. Um, we, we need interaction. Again, that's where knowledge really is created. And lastly, as I say, without other people, you don't know who you are. There is a need for human inter interdependency. Without other people, you don't have an identity. Okay? We could take that further, and it would, it would get a little weird and a little too philosophical, but the idea that without other people, you don't really exist. Okay? So we need that. We need all of those things in order to be democratic citizens. 
from that list of characteristics, that long list of characteristics, I, I've come to um, the point where I really believe that it is that education has the lion's share of responsibility um, in creating democratic citizens. Okay. We have to teach students how to treat one another. We have to teach them how to be concerned for the common good. Uh, we have to teach them how to talk about social problems. And I think sometimes in education we avoid that. We avoid talking about social problems because they make us uncomfortable. We also, sometimes as educators, um, don't talk about social problems because then we have to reveal our position on them. Okay. Um, we have to teach students how to um, engage with issues, to discuss issues. Um, we should make these very low stakes. These discussions or dialogues should be very low stakes because the ultimate goal is for students to, to again, be very self-conscious of their position and then be willing to change it, to have the capacity to change that position or value. Um, we want students to engage in open, equal conversation. Um, this is where learning takes place. We need to teach our students to be empathetic. Okay? We need to teach them to be able to put themselves in someone else's shoes. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We need to um, create a means by which knowledge is produced in our classrooms, again, usually through dialogue, um, on a really good day in one of my classes, my students will make an effort to um, see things from a, a position other than their own. Okay? On a really good day, my students are willing to actually change their position based on information that they gained from what someone else said. Um, I will say this, it is, it is always incumbent on the teacher to do so. It is always incumbent on the teacher to see things from a different point of view. Okay. So then, um, education at its best, like I said earlier, does mean transformation. It means transformation on a personal level, a social level, a civic level. Um, it, then it means understanding that we all have positions and that we're tied to these in, a, in order to make sense of the world that we live in. But we have to have that capacity and willingness to change. Uh, the democratic classroom treats all positions with respect. It pushes students towards self-consciousness for really understanding the positions and values that they have and um, being willing to um, challenge those. Um, if students are pushed towards self-consciousness regarding the positions that they have, they are then also pushed toward the corollary of that, which is changing them. Um, education is really the sphere in which public opinion is shaped and then reshaped. Uh, education is the sphere in which citizens are created or are not created. Uh, it's the sphere in which most, um, some of the most powerful democratic actions and social movements have taken, that have ever actually occurred in American history have taken place. Um, when we look at organizations like the NAACP, that occurs in the civic sphere of society. That occurs, and then if we take that civic sphere, that is education. That is also being concerned for the common good. Okay? We have to deal with today's issues, no matter how uncomfortable they make us. And we have to get our students to um, break from that culture of silence and be willing to talk about things that um, they're embarrassed about or ashamed about or you know maybe that make them angry or make them fearful or um, make them scared or maybe get them to share an opinion that they have never said out loud before right they carry these ideas within them and they don't speak about them because because of that culture of silence and even the fear of freedom the fear of being able to say what you want to say so you don't okay really the um, most important point here is that democracies don't work unless the crucial quality of caring about the common good is present among the majority. The classroom really is a microcosm of society and its education's work to teach us how to think, to question, revise, review, care about um, the well-being of others and the condition of others, and most, most importantly, to act. It is um, the responsibility of educators to make their students comfortable with being active civic participants. 
It is the role of educators, the responsibility of educators, to teach their students how to treat one another, to teach their students how to, how to again, treat, treat others on a state lo or a local, state, or national level. It is the responsibility of educators to teach their students how to be critical thinkers. It is the responsibility of educators and of education to teach our students how to function within a democratic society. It's our responsibility also to teach our students to be democratic in spirit to truly be democrat, you know, as a mode of being as Dewey says. One of the things that I really fear is how um, education has been responsible for the destruction of democracy or the decline of democracy by avoiding talking about these issues, by avoiding um, instilling these characteristics and qualities into our students. We can't do that. We, we have to, again, take on the lion's share of responsibility here and make our students um, ready for the world that they live in and um, to be active members of that world and not worry just about their place in it, but the, the common good. So that's where I'm at. Any questions anybody would like to ask me about democracy and education? I know I said a lot about Dewey. There are many, many others who have written about this same issue. Frary, as we've read in class. Plato, obviously. You know, when he wrote Allegory of the Cave, he wasn't talking about politics. He was talking about education. Um, and then, you, you know, going on, many others, if anybody wants more information about it, you could certainly email me or contact me, and I'd be happy to give that to you. But again, we can't separate democracy from education and see democracy as just being these mechanical duties like voting. You know, it has to be an embodiment. I just want to um, say that you're, thank you so much for your talk. I think that it's um, timely in light of the um, boycotts in some um, public school districts of the mm -hmm. ISAT that no longer will be administered next year because right. of the changes in Common Core. So it's interesting to think about um, the idea of questioning mm -hmm. um, with many parents in those districts um, opting out of the ISAT this week. I'm actually one of those parents. Um, uh, because of it, p people really thinking about is this useful, right? They're asking right. the question to the districts, and the districts really don't have an answer. And I think this is, in many ways, exactly what you're talking about. Well, and what we've talked about in my classes, um, and uh, I'm going to again go back to Freire, who says that this banking system of education doesn't work, and that's what happens with the ISAT. Students are taught to the test. That doesn't work. And then taking it a step further and looking at Sir Ken Robinson, who is an educator. Uh, well, he was a former educator. Now he's pretty much an education reformer. But Ken Robinson says that tests like this are no good for us. They aren't part of the common good because they don't test for aptitudes and skills and abilities that some students have. So as we've talked about in my classes, if you're a dancer, you're going to bomb this test. If that's where your ability lies, you're going to bomb this test. It's not, it, it, you know, it's not um, going to be a correct assessment of your abilities or your potentials because it's not where your intelligence lies. And how unfair that we value some sorts of intelligence and we devalue others. And again, we've had conversations in class about this exact theme, um, thing. I'm sorry. You know, what, does it, what does it do to us when really what our educational system in America is doing is educating us to then be productive. Our system is educating us to be workers because we don't value other kinds of intelligence. Sorry, Tammy. I kind of got on my rant there. Thank you. Sorry. That's wonderful. Um, any other questions, thoughts, comments? Yes, dear. Oh, how much I like agree with what you're saying. And I just recently just came from a sociology class and we were talking about like McDonaldization and how they like instead of giving someone like the food and it takes you time to actually make one thing, they are teaching people to be efficient and productive with all their time and it's becoming a machine and it's just like and I think like society is becoming like like that, like a, just a big machine and it's just not working out well. I think kind of what you're saying, Heather, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what you're saying is that we've lost that human touch, right, that human interaction. And again, that's one of the, one of the key characteristics if we're going to have a true democratic um, society and if we are going to be truly democratic, we have to have that interdependency. I depend on you because you're my sister. I depend on you because you're my brother. I depend on you because you are my neighbor. I depend on you because um, you are a part of me, basically, right? Kind of Walt Whitman-ish there. But nonetheless, that, that's the idea. And the human, the human interdependency, the dialogue, the connectedness, the interconnectedness of society gets lost 
we appreciate all of the um, expediency with which we get things, right? I love Amazon, you know, but there's no face that I'm putting with that name when I get that package two days later. I, you know, I, I don't want to get off on an entirely different tangent here, but when we look at um, the corporatization of America, um, you know, and how Walmart has put so many businesses out of, out, out of business, um, I think that this is where this comes from. We, we don't know how to be democratic as a mode of being any longer, and we allow the expediency and the ease of having Walmarts in our society. Um, and, you know, again, I don't want to get off on another tangent here, but I think that this sort of corporatization is making its way into education, where education used to be, you know, I, I don't have a board here, and I certainly can't draw well anyway, but, um, you know, we have these spheres, and we have the sphere of the state. And so state are these institutions and agencies, which the college is one, right? Because we're a state institution, we're an educational institution. We have a sphere of economy. And that sphere of economy is our personal and, and private wealth. And then we have the civic sphere. And the civic sphere, in my mind, is where all good things happened. <laughs> Um, not all good things, but many good things happen there. And the civic sphere isn't doing anything for the benefit of the state or for the economy. The civic sphere is, is doing things for the common good. So again, like NAACP, just one example, right? Because I think we're probably all familiar with that. That civic sphere is losing its hold in education because we aren't, we aren't educating for um, democratic purposes any longer. We aren't teaching people to be democratic. So the state and the economy is taking hold and actually sort of has a stranglehold on education because we're educating people to be productive, which then leads them out into that economic sphere. It also means that the economy drives education to some degree. Right? So the economy gets to dictate some of what happens in education. I wish we could make, I hope that we can make, I want to try to make that civic sphere have more have more importance. And so I didn't mean to hijack what you said, dear. I really didn't. But um, it, it's an important thing to me, and I think it's an important thing to you to still have that interconnectedness and that human touch. We don't need just the expediency of getting your cheeseburger to you in 15 seconds, but have some human interaction there. Other questions that anybody might have? Thoughts, comments, maybe? And can I ask? Oh, her, um, sorry. I wonder if you could talk just for a second about community colleges, because I do think there's a different kind of role and relationship with the community than other forms of higher education, and how that connects with Dewey and with what you're saying. Absolutely. I think the community college does a better job than really any other institution of being democratic, because we are a community, right? Not only within the walls of our school, but we are, we are um, intrinsically and directly tied to the community where our college is located. I think one of the very best ways for us to practice democracy in our community or in our community college is through um, service learning. I really do. I think that's a wonderful opportunity for you. Um, not only are you showing your, your um, faith, in, faith in other people, your um, you know, hope for the common good, you're acting on that. I also think that in community colleges, since we get such a broad demographic, we have people of you know, all shapes, sizes, ages, colors, races, ethnicities, religions, um, heights, weights, you got it, right? We get everybody through these doors. And that changes us too, right? That changes us too because that makes us, um, just by nature of the diversity of our classrooms, it, al it almost automatically makes us more democratic because we have to listen to opinions or we should want to listen to opinions. Um, that are maybe very different than our own, right? Because other people are bringing in their positions and values, and th how are those positions and values formed? Through experiences. And so when we have a broad variety of people, and again, really diverse classrooms, we have very diverse uh, um, positions and values, and it changes us and educates us to listen to those. The community college is an absolutely wonderful microcosm for democratic society as a whole. It is. Um, Again, I think service learning is a wonderful opportunity. Participation in your community college, um, you know, taking the community, co community college outside of the college and into the community is wonderful. Um, those are my ideas, I guess, about how that works. I, I, I think this is like, this is where it happens. This more so than a university. This so more, than, more so than a, than a four-year private college. This more so than even a middle elementary high school. 
Community college is where that happens. Other questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, etc., that you might have? No? Okay. Well, I thank you all very much for attending today and for bearing with me and my students who have heard this all. But, um, you know, if there are, again, any information you'd like or any questions you have, thoughts that you have, please get in touch. I'm happy to share. Okay. Let's give Anne a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for your talk. Very important talk. And once again, thank you all for attending. Uh, please uh, attend the uh, last two of the lectures in the series, one on Tuesday, March 18th. It's actually an earlier session. I'll be speaking about feminism and democracy. I think it's appropriate given it's Women's History Month. Mm -hmm. And then in April, on April 24th, on Thursday from 11 to 12, we'll also have another uh, lecture, but it won't be in the library. It'll be in B119, but we'll have advertisement up to remind you of um, the time and place of those uh, two lectures. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.